What's their case? They say, you know what? If you keep the blood pressure down, you can prevent this hemorrhagic transformation. Really? It's not a blood pressure issue. It's a reperfusion issue. From Harvard to Yale to University of Miami to Georgia to UVA, in this courtroom, they have told you hemorrhagic transformation is not a blood pressure mediated problem. It doesn't matter if the number's high or low, it's reperfusion that you can't predict and you can't prevent. And when it happens, the die is cast. That's what happened on November the 19th, 2011. You know, Mr. Forberg said in his testimony here, if I just known, I would have taken her to Jupiter Medical Center. Have you heard from somebody from Jupiter Medical Center in this case? Dr. Collins, the emergency room physician that testified yesterday. If they go to Jupiter Medical Center, they're going to get the same treatment because it's the standard of care. Dr. Collins explained to you, 30 years ago, we thought blood pressure was a problem because it could pop a vessel. But that's old science. We know that's not true. We know it's a reperfusion injury. Why do they bring you an expert who gives you 30-year-old science that has been proven to be false? Dr. Ross, our neurologist, comes in and tells you, you know what? Unfortunately, I've spent my life treating people with strokes and doing research on what can be done for strokes. And I'm here to tell you, there's nothing that could have been done for Mrs. Forberg as unfortunate as it is. Because hemorrhagic transformation cannot be predicted, it cannot be prevented, and when it happens, it's catastrophic. And we know it happened in the hospital with a right occipital lobe lesion. It's not just the cerebellar lesion. It happens when she's in the hospital, in the ICU, with critical care specialists and neurosurgeons and neurologists and all these people that the plaintiff want to talk about. They were there, and she still had a hemorrhagic transformation because you can't prevent it. Dr. Papa Regino, their only causation expert, tells you, you know what? If she's in the hospital, you can have her on pulse oximetry. Maybe that makes a difference. And then I asked her, Dr. Papa Regina, let's, let's look at the data. Let's look at the evidence. Her pulse oximetry is normal when she gets back to the hospital. It doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't change. The changes happen at 9.20 p.m. when she's in the hospital, where she already has a neurosurgeon on board. She's been admitted to the hospital. The films are done. That's when the changes occur. It's not something in the afternoon while she's at home. Dr. Papa Regina spent, I don't know how much time talking about brain is time, time is brain. It's a cute phrase, it's a catchphrase. It's one they hope that you will write down and forget what it really means. That has to do with TPA, the clot buster drug, that she was never a candidate for. They, their experts say she's not a candidate for TPA. It's not an issue in this case, but they like the phrase, time is brain, brain is time. Because it sounds good, but it's not science. It's not the science in this case because she was never a candidate for TPA. Dr. Papagina talks about, well, if she's in the hospital, you can keep, keep her from vomiting. You can keep her from vomiting if she takes the medications that were given to her, if she truly is vomiting. And then she said, well, you can keep her quiet and calm in a bed. What did Mr. Forbert tell you? I take her home. She goes to bed. She's there the rest of the day. I'm checking on her every 15 minutes. She's not walking around the house doing things. She's quiet and calm and she's at home. And he's checking on her every 15 minutes. Dr. Papa Regino, their only causation expert, tells you if she's in the hospital, surgery's the cure. We can surgically treat her and she can be normal. Dr. Papa Regino is not a surgeon. She doesn't ever hold a scalpel in her hands. She's not taking patients into the OR. You've heard from two surgeons in this case. Dr. Afshar, the treating surgeon, who, by the way, plaintiff says, oh, he told you to infect both eyes if she had a TIA three weeks earlier. What did he really say? It's a single visual field. 
that gets affected. A patient loses vision on one side. It may be a central problem, and there may be impact on both eyes, but the patient loses visual field on one side, which is exactly the history reported to multiple people in the hospital of this event three weeks to a month earlier, where she has sudden loss of vision in her eye, a TIA, a precursor, a warning sign to a stroke. And Dr. Afshar told you, as much as I would like to be able to save everybody, there's nothing I could have done for her in the hospital, out of the hospital, because of this hemorrhagic transformation that could not be treated. Dr. Romano explains to you a similar concept, the other, only other neurosurgeon who testifies. It's the rapidity of the deterioration that prevents a surgeon from doing anything. And she's not a surgical candidate before 9.20 p.m. She's in the hospital. She's admitted. She's got a critical care specialist, a neurosurgeon on board. The films are done when this happens. And despite being in the hospital, all this work has already been done, surgery is not going to make a difference when she becomes a candidate for the procedure. There's just nothing that could have been done to prevent her outcome and her death in the hospital or not, as unfortunate as it is, because despite all of the advances in medicine, six million people die from a stroke every year. The case is not about whether Monsanto's conduct in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s met today's standard of ordinary care. Um, in those four days, I had a friend of mine who, who wrote something for me, and if, with your permission, I, I'm going to read it because I couldn't memorize this. And it goes right to this point about applying today's standards to the Monsanto of the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. So my friend wrote, let's look at a typical day for a person in 2016 and some of the ways it differed from that person in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Now, she might get up in the morning and get ready for work. Before leaving the house, she might take out the garbage, including her recycling bin. No, no recycling in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, or the 60s, actually. She has a, dro uh, she has a drop off her child at daycare. Should have thought about this. And so she puts him in a child car seat. Didn't exist until, how, look, what, 20 years ago, maybe? She puts on her seat belt. Some of you may remember cars before they had seat belts. Starts the car, probably with a push start, which didn't exist. And the airbags are activated. Now, remember, all cars didn't have airbags until, what, roughly 10 years ago? She has to stop for gas, which is unleaded only. If remember, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there was leaded gasoline, and that didn't switch over, I think, until the mid-60s, if not later. She also stops to pick up her prescription at a pharmacist who hands her a bottle of pills covered in warning labels. Now, we know how pill bottles look today. Didn't look that way back then. Driving to work, she passes a Walmart where there used to be a large factory. She remembers her parents telling her about when the factory was operating. You could always smell a particular odor and how smoke used to billow up from its smokestacks. You don't see that today. As she goes into her office, she passes a group of people sheltered together and smoking cigarettes. I remember that people used to smoke in, in the office back in the 30s, the 40s. I mean, we've, we've seen Don Draper on TV in Mad Men. She tells her friend, hello, who is in a wheelchair using a handicap, a handicap ramp, non-existent back in those days. She's the vice president of the company and has recently returned from a, from a three-month maternity leave, non-existent in the 40s, 50s, 60s, of course, in the 30s. That day, OSHA is coming in to inspect the workplace. Didn't exist till the early 70s. At lunch, she goes to the company cafeteria, which offers organic food and gluten-free food. Again, something that didn't exist. Nothing has hydrogenated oil. Of course, 
We all heard how hydrogenated oil gets to us. After she drives from work with her friend, she uses the HOV lane. Then she picks up her child from daycare and parks her Prius in the driveway. This is how life is different from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And this is what I ask you to keep in mind when you're talking about whether or not Monsanto is acting as a reasonable company. To compare Monsanto to our standards of, the, of today would be unfair. It would be unfair to any of us. We have to compare Monsanto to what was happening at the time the event occurred. And that is whether Monsanto was a perfect company. Mr. Paul is absolutely correct. I'll admit to you right now, Monsanto was not a perfect company. Of the, of the thousands of people who worked there over 40 years, not all of them wrote perfect memos. Not all of them wrote perfect letters. Not all of them said the right things. But what we gave plaintiffs and their experts the opportunity to do was go back and look at hundreds of thousands of records, as you heard. And they could pull out each and every paper that they thought would be important to try to basically make you mad today and over the last two weeks. Because if they don't make you mad at Monsanto, they don't win this case. If you don't walk back into that jury room upset about what Monsanto did in the 30s, the 40s, and 50s based upon today, then you can't find for the plaintiff. Whether PCBs are in the environment and whether we all have PCBs in our body. Yes, they're all in the, they're in the environment. Yes, we all have PCBs in our body. What are we going to talk about that? At what level? The case is not about, and this is important, whether PCBs might cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or possibly cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or may have caused the plaintiff's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or that at some point in the future, which you heard during, during expert testimony, it may be discovered that plaintiffs, that PCBs cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Be careful with our words. Hold these lawyers, all of us, to a very high standard as to what words we use. Cancer being one of them and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Might, possibly, may, when we look over the studies, keep, keep that standard high. Were we even sitting in the same courtroom for the last two months? It kind of reminds me of an ancient proverb that says there's three things that are very hard to keep hidden for long. It's the sun, the moon, and the truth. And you just heard Mr. Cartmel apologize for these 1998 records that somehow have gone missing or absent and somehow Ms. Shear forgot about for 17 years. You have not heard the word, the, the, the single word uttered over the last two hours of Nielsen, Dr. Nielsen. And we'll talk more about that. And ladies and gentlemen, this case is really uncomfortable. We could have been here two weeks. The only benefit of the fact that we were here longer is we discovered these records. And there's still a great gap in the medical history. Remember that. And they have used that for their advantage every single step of the way. And we got a kernel of the truth five weeks into trial where we found out that the exact mesh that is at the issue in all these articles talking about hernia mesh and other types of mesh, the exact type of mesh that is supposedly heavyweight, has bad pore size, that exact type of mesh was used in Ms. Shear's body in 1998. And not just a little bit, a lot. A lot more than the amount of mesh used in the solids. At the end of the day, this case is not complicated. All of Ms. Shear's complaints are related to her problems with her hip and her back and the hernia. It's not complicated. You have heard tons of evidence showing that neither of the products at issue in this case, either the Solex or, or the Align, are unreasonably dangerous. 
That's the standard. It's not dangerous. It's unreasonably dangerous. How can a product, and, and I mean both these products, how can a products that have been approved by the FDA still allowed to be sold today and are being used at every hospital in the United States and are endorsed by every physician's organization in the world, how can they be unreasonably dangerous? I mean, it's hard to keep a straight face and argue that. The warnings. You have not heard a single person say that these warnings were so somehow inadequate other than Dr. Rosenzweig. But you heard from Dr. Gro Greenspan with respect to the Solex, the warnings were adequate. He knew all of that information, but he never, ever even met in this year. And then finally, there's claims about negligence. They, again, the plaintiffs want to argue that somehow both of these companies who complied with all of the Fed FDA guidelines, all of the guidelines from the international standards organizations, that somehow these companies are negligent, it doesn't pass the straight face test. The truth, which has come out, even before any of the lawyers came out, you saw it, you knew it. The truth is, is that Ms. Shear has not been injured by surgical mesh. And all of the efforts by Mr. Davis to talk about all of these injuries, the ice pick sensation to the vagina, and all of the things that he raised on these boards, talking about all her pain and complications. Ladies and gentlemen, all of those are related to other causes. And it's not related to the surgical mesh. But, but why are they trying to induce sympathy? Two things that, that you have probably been very clear to you is that why do they want to induce sympathy? And then also the second one is why do they want to make you angry? Why do they want to trash companies? Why do they want to make you prejudiced? And that's the only way to describe it. Why do they want to make you prejudiced about companies that are creating products to benefit women? Well, it all comes down to the fact that, and I talked a little bit about this in Boisier, about the decision-making process. And all of you said that you could follow the evidence and look at it without passion and prejudice. They know that you don't make good decisions when you're angry or when you're sympathetic. You do make good decisions when you follow the proof and you look for evidence <coughs> and you don't fall prey to prejudice and sympathy and trashing companies. So let's try to do that together. So let's get to the heart of this case because we have Miss Bailey's catheter. And you saw Dr. Sampson describe what he thought took place in the surgery. And he showed you with the small Lundquist wire. He stood up here um, with Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Davis, and he showed you putting the small, stiff Lundquist wire down, how he believed the injury happened with the catheter and the focus of the fluoroscopy up here instead of down there. All right, so what was wrong with that? First of all, Dr. Sampson didn't use the actual Lundquist wire, which was used during the surgery, which is more than 200 centimeters. That's defendant's exhibit number 13, and you'll have this with you. And he also didn't show you how Dr. Corso had actually used this catheter before he inserted the Lundquist wire so that the catheter was far enough down. that when the Lundquist wire went in, it went into a safe location. And it wouldn't just go right into the heart. And that that was all done while he was observing it under fluoroscopy. So the idea that he inserted the Lundquist wire without this safety precaution, which is really what this is, somebody who's looking out for the safety of Ms. Bailey to make sure the Lundquist wire, the stiff wire, doesn't just go in wherever and cause injury, 
That's what this device was used for. That's somebody who's being reasonable and complying with the standard of care. And then as the catheter and other devices are being inserted, and I know we've talked about this extensively and you all paid attention and you know what I'm referring to, when the wire is in, and it was a long enough wire, and the catheter's moving down, what Dr. Sampson said was, that's when you should have fluoroscopy looking down here, not up here. And Dr. Dobler and Dr. Vino completely disagree. That's not how they were taught. That's not how they do the procedure. That's not how Dr. Vino teaches the residents in Savannah how to do it. Dr. Corso agrees that's, that's actually dangerous because you need to watch where the catheter is going. It can cause an injury if you don't watch it here. At a minimum, at a minimum, that may be some disagreement between the doctors about where to look. But does it make common sense to you that you should not be watching when you're advancing things like this over a wire into a person's anatomy? And can these things cause devastating complications? Absolutely they can. So what Dr. Corso is doing is reasonable. It's not only what Dr. Vino and Dr. Dobler would do, but it's what they teach to other surgeons in doing this procedure. If you believe Mr. Bakker had his right to a signal on and did check his mirrors, then he has done nothing wrong. It is also quite extraordinary about this case. I'm sure you heard us talk about how you do use common sense when you hear this word. All of you are drivers. Is it reasonably foreseeable to a driver of any vehicle that a bicyclist is going to pass the driver's car on the right side in a 9 inch to 18 inch wide cover when the driver has his right turn signal? No. No one would anticipate. As far as uh, crossing the white line, the far line, it's really quite incredible to hear comments that Trar didn't cross the white line when that's what the plaintiff's expert Armstrong said in his overhead animation. Discussion about uh, traffic uh, statute. You need to be three feet away from a bicyclist. Well, he was when Mr. Tron was on the shoulder. When the shoulder ends and the gutter begins, they get closer and closer. Mr. Parker doesn't see Mr. Tron doesn't know that he needs to be further away, he is fully within his travel lane, and it's Mr. Trar who enters the travel lane. He's in the travel lane in front of Mr. Bakri, if you believe their expert. Beside Mr. Bakri. You heard the continued effort by counsel Plankett to call the shoulder of the road that ends before the intersection, a lane. He said it in opening. He said it several times. It is not a lane. That is not a travel lane. I don't believe it. Uh, I'm going to briefly tell you, if, if in this case, you decide that Mr. Bakker was not negligent, as we think you should, you don't consider damages. But what you've just seen is, in our view, an extraordinary request for an excessive amount of damages, even though we fully admit this man had a very serious injury.